15. Precipice. Kate. When Eric's foot slips sideways, I know he's in trouble. My heart seizes as he jumps. The fire that chews through brags casts a halo around Eric's form. His arms windmill, his legs churn on empty air as if an invisible walkway spans the nothingness beneath his feet. Shit, he's not gonna make it. Ben's words crash over me. As soon as he releases the words, I know it's true. Eric's trajectory is too short. He's going to miss the edge. He's going to fall into the Noya River and die. Eric! I lunge, arms outstretched, even though there's no mathematically possible way for me to catch him. Ben hurls himself forward, running for the chasm. He slips off the giant backpack of weapons he's been carrying since we left the pink house. He hurls the pack into the open space, bellowing Eric's name. My first thought is nonsensical. How can a backpack full of weapons save Eric from a 200-foot drop into the river? Does Ben intend for him to use it as a raft? As a cushion to blunt his plummet? His intent unfurls before me in slow motion. The pack snaps out, floating in open air for several seconds. Ben's fist closes around one strap, knuckles white in the ever-growing firelight. Grab it, he roars. Eric's body drops, swooshing down through the air. He collides with the large backpack, wrapping his body around it like a monkey. The force of his collision yanks Ben to the ground. Eric disappears from sight, eyes wide behind the lenses of his glasses as gravity sucks him downward. The last thing I see are his limbs wrapped around the backpack as he holds on for dear life. Ben smacks to the ground with a grunt. His body slides across gravel and debris, and he's pulled toward the edge by Eric's weight. I throw myself on the ground, wrapping myself around one of his legs. Ben! Panic surges into my throat. Fear of losing two people I love hammers at me. Eric! Caleb throws himself on Ben's other leg, the two of us wrestling with his limbs like they're giant anacondas. His body slides another foot, then grinds to a halt. Do you have him? I cry. I've got him. Ben's torso is half swallowed by the gap. Pull us up. I grapple with his leg, winding my fists into the fabric. I struggle into a sitting position, but as soon as I shift, his body slides forward another few inches. Ash and Reed materialize. Reed takes hold of Ben's belt. Ash latches onto the back of his shirt. With Reed and Ash anchoring Ben's body, Caleb and I scramble to our feet and join them. Together, the four of us pull them up. Ben's shoulders and head appear, dragged up from the abyss. His knuckles haven't slackened on the strap of the backpack. A third hand appears, latching onto the side of the broken pavement. I break away and rush toward Eric. I snatch his wrist and pull, leaning back and throwing all my weight into a counterbalance. Reed grabs me around the waist to help. Eric's body rolls across the ground. The backpack tumbles free of his grasp. He flops under the pavement, sucking in deep, terrified gasps. Eric! I fling myself at him, attempting to lift him up into a hug. He's bigger than I am, but I try anyway. Reed joins me. Between the two of us, we manage to haul him to his feet. We cluster in a tight embrace. Tears make my cheeks wet. I thought we'd lost you. I dig my fingers into Eric's shoulder. You scared the shit out of me. Breath saws in and out of his throat. The lenses of his glasses are foggy from the smoke, but I can still see the whites of his eyes. Shit, he whispers. That was close. Good thing I'm not fat anymore. Reed squeezes both of us. For a few seconds there, I thought I was going to lose a brother. You scared the shit out of me, dude. Johnny and Carter would kick my ass if I came home without you. We all laugh. The sound tinged with the residual panic that clings to us. I'm getting too old for this shit. Someone grumbles behind me. 
Next time, some other shithead gets to risk his ribcage with my dumb shit maneuver. I break away from Eric and Reed, whirling around to face Ben. The front of his shirt is ripped, the side of his cheek is abraded from the concrete, but he, too, is gloriously intact and alive. This should make me happy, ecstatic, overwhelmed with joy. I feel none of those things. I am overtaken by a surge of anger as my mind flashes through the last sixty seconds. I could have lost Ben. He could have been stolen away from me just like Kyle had been stolen. Thinking about this is like stepping through a time machine back to the day Kyle died, to the day Carter and I came home and found him dead on the front walkway of our house. I haven't thought about that day since I said goodbye to Kyle on the Avenue of the Giants. It all comes rushing back to me now. I recall the way the world fell out from beneath my feet. I recall the way I had lived, directionless, for the next two years. I'd been a shell of myself. I stalk toward Ben and shove him, hard. What the fuck? I yell. You almost died. He blinks at me, absorbing my anger with a wrinkled brow. The kid would have died. I smack him on the shoulder. When he just stares at me, I hit him again. Then I hit him a third time, just because I don't know what else to do. My anger is irrational. I know this. But I can't turn the giant tidal wave of fear and anger crashing all around me. Kate. He tries to reach for me. I sidestep, turning my back on him. I can't even look at him right now. My tumbling emotions threaten to unravel me right here on this broken bridge. Tears blur the edges of my vision. I swipe them away with an angry hand. As I do, the world south of the bridge leaps into focus for the first time. I'd been so intent on seeing everyone safely over the Noya River, I hadn't paid any attention to what was beyond it. We've all done our share of shouting in the commotion of the last five minutes. It has not gone unnoticed. Stumbling towards us in a mass of rot are a dozen zombies. They raise their arms, moans piercing the smoky air. The light of the growing fire paints their bodies a lurid orange. Get your weapons out, I snarl, fists closing on my knives. These fuckers are going down. I turn a glare on my people, letting it linger on Ben longer than necessary. And if any of you even thinks about getting bitten, I'm going to kick your ass. Normally, seven against twelve isn't great odds. Normally, I wouldn't think of pitting us against so many. But today is different. Our determination is electric. I feel it gathering around our tight-knit group. Braggs has not been kind to us. We may have left the main part of the city, but we still have several miles of outskirts to make it through. We didn't survive two bridges, a horde of zombies, and a fire just to die now. No fucking way. She's scary when she's mad. It takes me a second to register Ash's voice. I ignore her, focusing on the horde that lurches in our direction. They're thirty feet away and closing. We're killing these assholes and getting the hell out of Bragg's. I sense Ben's presence just behind my left shoulder, hovering at my back. I'm so angry I can't look at him or acknowledge his presence. I break into a run, charging at the undead. The first of them dies with my knife buried in its forehead. I yank it free, spinning around to kill the next monster that reaches for me. This one gets a zombat to the nose. More of them edge in, closing around me like the petals of a carnivorous plant. I bare my teeth and slash at the next closest one. Damn it, Kate! Ben stabs one in the back of the head, flinging it aside. Watch yourself! Eric steps up on his other side, smashing the skull of a zombie in his path. All my people are there. 
Smoke from the fire swirls around us as we fight, cutting a bloody path through the undead. Within minutes, we're surrounded by a pile of dead bodies. We pause, all of us panting from the small battle. I take in the scattering of small shops, restaurants, motels, and low-roofed homes that stretch before us. The road, still four lanes wide, is cluttered with abandoned cars and zombies. Many of the zombies make their way toward us. I don't know if they're drawn by the fire or if they're attracted to the commotion we made. It doesn't matter. They're nothing but an obstacle course to overcome. We move fast, I say. We avoid the zombies when possible. If we have to fight our way through, we fight in pairs. Eric and Ben, Ash and Caleb, me and Reed. I ignore the exasperated scowl Ben throws my way. We watch one another's backs. We all get out of here alive. Understand? I wait until I see everyone nod in understanding. I turn and break into a run. A boom rips through the air. Another ball of fire leaps into the sky, blooming over the south side of Bragg's like a blazing mushroom. Shit, shit, shit. I'd been so worried about the fire on the north side of Bragg's that I hadn't paused to consider there might be fire on the south side, too. Gas line, Caleb asks. More likely a gas station, Eric replies. This town is going to burn to the ground. Come on, I snarl. We have to run. Sixteen. Tennis racket. Jessica. I lay on my stomach on the bed, my mind drifting as the asshole on top of me grunts and groans. Instead of focusing on what's happening to my body, I focus on my surroundings. This very bed, this twin-sized piece of foam is the bed I shared with Sean. We lived in this tiny trailer together for months like we were still husband and wife. There wasn't enough room in the fort for people not to double up, and we preferred rooming with each other rather than strangers. I didn't mind. Not really. Even if we weren't married anymore, Sean was all I had left. I still loved him. There was something nice about laying down on the mattress with him at the end of a long day. After he left me for Richard, it was something I never thought I'd do again. In those rare moments of darkness, I liked to pretend we were still married. I'd take the apocalypse any day of the week if it meant I could keep Sean. Pieces of Sean remain in the room. His jacket is wadded up on the far corner of the mattress. A small Girl Scout patch he found on a scavenging run is tacked to the wooden wall. It's a tribute to our lost daughters, who'd been on a Girl Scout camping trip when they died. Around the Girl Scout patch are over a dozen $100 bills. Sean collected those, too. He joked that one day, when toilet paper ran out, he was going to use them to wipe his ass. My eyes traveled to the dented tennis racket on my side of the bed. Besides my crushed soul, it's the only thing I brought out of that Girl Scout camping trip. It had been covered in blood and bits of hair. Wispy, light brown hair with a hint of curls at the end. Claire and May had the perfect combination of my dark brown hair and Sean's curly blonde. I feel like that tennis racket most days. I'd taken it to the campground with the intention of hitting some balls in the morning while people still slept. We'd been at one of those over-accessorized campgrounds with a swimming pool, miniature golf course, playground, bocce ball courts, and various other activities to entertain kids. Instead, I used it to put down my own children. To save my ex-husband who had left me for another man. 
I may have smashed in little Claire's head with the racket, but it may as well have been a knife through my heart. I don't know why I kept it. It's a memento of my worst nightmare. It's easy to ignore the sweating monster pounding into me when I see the tennis racket. My mind fogs over, drowning in memories that are so much worse than the ones being made today. My dead kids don't know it. But in a really fucked up way, they're saving me right now. I let my head roll to one side as the next asshole pounds into me. In the end, it's all simple mechanics. The only thing I have to do is not resist. Biology takes care of the rest. My eyes settle again on the tennis racket. It had been a gift from Sean on our eighth wedding anniversary. A bubblelot pure strike. I'd cherished that racket more than any other gift he'd given me. Three days after Sean gave me the tennis racket, I'd found the second cell phone he carried to stay in touch with Richard. It had been dumb misfortune to find that phone. Sometimes I wonder what life would have been like if I'd never found it. Would I have hummed along in blissful ignorance? Or would Sean still have left me? Resentment surges inside me. Even after a year and a half of therapy, I hadn't been able to find peace with my new Seanless reality. He'd taken away the simple joy I found in making ham and cheese sandwiches and cutting up paper gingerbread men. Before the apocalypse, I took out my rage on my tennis partners bitchy stay-at-home moms from the private school our daughters attended. Their life purpose seemed to be hunting down all the latest small-town gossip and spreading it around like smallpox. To be honest, I detested them. But I loved tennis more than I loathed them, so I put up with their petty shit. Still, their friendship wasn't free. I fed them just enough gossip about my divorce to keep them on the tennis court with me. Then I pounded the hell out of them with my backspins and drop shots. So ironic that I used that same tennis racket to save Sean. So terrible that I also used it to put down my zombie children. I close my eyes, letting the pain wash over me. The asshole on top of me is nothing compared to the things I've suffered with my tennis racket. Seventeen. Truck. Kate. In front of us, the fire rages. The flames whoosh back and forth like banners, the crackling fabric rippling as it moves. Buildings snap, pop, and collapse as the fire devours them. The noise acts as a zombie magnet. All around, the undead moan and make their way toward the noise. It's so loud, most of them don't notice the desperate humans plunging down the road. Our rubber-soled shoes are mere whispers on the ground. Only our breathing is heavy and harsh, but it's swallowed up by the destructive inferno behind us. The highway through the outskirts of Braggs is still four lanes wide. Despite this, our path is far from clear. Every time a zombie stumbles in front of us or draws too close, we're forced to take it out. Ben jumps in front of me as two zombies step in my direction with outstretched arms. He moves fast the knife a blur as it punches first one zombie in the head, then another. Even after how I treated him, he's still looking out for me. He's barely dispatched them when Caleb confronts another, this one a rotund man with pants that sag around his rotting middle. Caleb swings his zombat, clocking the fat zombie in the side of the face. My eyes flick left, right, then left again, scanning our surroundings as we run. 
The highway is like a giant obstacle course. We swerve around cars and bodies. Any time a large group of zombies appears, I lead my people in the other direction. We zigzag down the road of death, killing when we have to. I wish we could use the Alpha Zom recording, but after the near miss in Bragg's, we can't risk it. I've already seen two Alphas in the surrounding chaos, both of them leading large packs away from the fire. I can't risk drawing the attention of one. My insides twist as I see the horde of zombies stumbling toward us. There's no fighting our way through it. There's no darting around it, either. I could lead my people into one of the side streets and hope for the best, but the undead drift out of every side street in sight. Damn it. I pound a fist on my thigh, desperate for a way out. I didn't bring my people all this way to die now. There has to be a way. Fifty yards away, I spot a Toyota Tacoma. It lists to one side, half on the sidewalk, half on the road. Before the apocalypse, the Tacoma was shiny yellow with chrome rims and oversized tires. Now the front grille is covered with undead gore. Blood streaks the sides. One tire is flat. Truck, I hiss. We can hide in the back. I tear toward the truck in a blind run. A swirling of the undead stand between us and the truck. I count twelve. We can take them. We have to take them. Ben, who still hasn't budged from my side, seems to understand my plan. He charges the first of the Zoms, taking it out with a knife through the eye. Reed is hard on his heels, the tall young man swinging his Zom bat with ruthless efficiency. He bludgeons one zombie on the head, then leaps forward another two steps and takes out another. Eric sprints past me, a glimpse of profile set in determination. His knives reflect the orange flames that paint the sky. He cuts around Caleb, stabbing the zombie that stumbles up behind his friend. The monster hasn't even hit the ground before Eric springs away. He's the first one to reach the truck. He spins around, planting himself in front of the truck like a defender of the Alamo. Ash is the next person to reach the truck. Eric darts forward, cutting off the zombie that closes in behind her. He kills it, buying Ash a few precious seconds to vault into the bed of the Tacoma. I cut down a zombie and rush to Eric's side, planting myself beside him. We fight without words as the zombies pour down the street, keeping one side of the Tacoma clear for our friends. Caleb and Reed vault into the truck. Ben looms out of the chaos with blood spattered all across his face and the front of his clothes. In. His word snaps at me like the end of a whip. There isn't time to argue. The big horde is drawing near, led at a shambling run by the Alpha. I hurl myself over the edge. Ben is about to rush one of the biggest zombies I've ever seen, a man easily six foot five and three hundred pounds. It barrels toward the truck with a keening cry. Ben recoils, bunching his muscles to spring into action. Eric beats him to it. He barrels into the zombie, mouth open in a silent scream. He jams both hands hard against the creature's chest. It stumbles back, snarling in surprise. Eric doesn't let it recover. His knife hand flashes down in rapid succession, breaking through the flesh and bone of the undead monster's face. Ben doesn't wait. He turns to the truck, flinging himself inside. I rush to the far edge, holding out a hand as Eric hauls ass back to the Tacoma. Three zombies pursue him, letting up a fresh set of whales. Eric jumps through the air like a spider, arms extended. I latch onto one forearm. Caleb grabs the other. We pull Eric inside, cushioning his fall as the three of us stumble backward onto the hard metal of the truck bed. The three zombies chasing Eric slam into the tailgate. They hiss and moan, claws digging at the metal and swiping at open air. Reed advances, jaw set. Ben grabs his arm and shakes his head, motioning for all of us to huddle near the center of the truck. Sandwiched between Caleb and Eric, I crouch in a sitting position. The rest of my people squish in around me. 
We are a silent, huddled mass in the center of the Tacoma. The three zombies at the tailgate continue to scratch and keen. Another dozen zombies surround the truck, led there by their Alpha. The Alpha, a teenage girl with half her hair torn away from her scalp, keens and clicks, calling more zombies to surround us. The Tacoma rocks back and forth as they moan and claw. I barely dare to breathe. My hands are sweaty around my knives. Adrenaline courses through my veins, sending tremors through my sweaty hands. South of us, the fire is gaining momentum. Big flames lick at the sky, belching up black plumes of smoke. If we don't get out of here soon, we might suffocate and burn to death. If we leave the truck bed, we risk being overrun. A zombie swipes at the open air above the truck, nails only inches from my face. It takes every shred of willpower not to swipe back, not to bury my knife in its face. But this is just one of many zombies surrounding the Tacoma. There's no way for us to fight our way free. The truck continues to rock. The zombies continue to hiss and moan. Eric's nostrils are flared, his muscles tense and ready to spring. Ben looks as fierce as ever, eyes flicking between the zombies and me. Ash and Caleb sit back to back, equal parts scared and determined. Reed crouches on the balls of his feet, looking ready to fling himself over the side of the truck and into the surrounding horde. The Alpha shoulders through the pack. When it bumps up against the truck, it pounds its fists against the metal with a shriek of frustration. The cry is echoed up the road by other zombies. The Alpha hisses, peeling itself away from the truck. The teenage undead pushes through its bellows and lets up a keen, cocking one ear to listen. Answering keen sound. More zombies turn in the direction of the Tacoma. Chills inch their way down my back and a dozen more zombies plow into the side of the truck, causing one of the wheels to lift off the ground. I latch onto Reed and dig the soles of my shoes into the floor, struggling to maintain my position. Reed returns my grasp, the two of us clinging to each other as the zombies plow into the truck a second time. It shoved several inches across the sidewalk. Holy shit! My mind races. If they do that another few times, they just might manage to flip the truck onto its side. Should I risk using the recording in my pack before that happens? A shoe repair shop stands no more than five feet away from the truck. The glass window is shattered. Inside are two corpses, desiccated and rotted from many months left exposed to the elements. At least fifteen zombies fill the narrow space between the truck and the shop. Could I use the alpha recording to cut a path from the truck to the shop? How we'll hold them off once we're inside the shop is beyond me, but at best we wouldn't be surrounded on all sides. The Tacoma bucks and slides again. Nails grind against paint. Our little group clings to one another, all of us smashed into the center of the bed. I study the front of the shoe repair shop, weighing our odds. Another push from the zombies will push us another few inches closer. That, combined with the Alpha, might... The truck rocks again, this time struck from the other side. It's pushed back in the other direction, sending several of the street-side zombies sprawling. Smoke gathers around us, growing thicker by the second... I tip my chin forward and suck from the drinking straw, willing myself not to cough. Sound will rile up the zombs even more. Eric rubs at his throat, working his jaw. I push the straw toward him, angling my body so he can drink. The others see what we're doing. They all take drinks from their packs. A boom echoes across the landscape, followed by a blinding flash of light. A rumble rolls through the ground. All around us, zombies are thrown to the ground. I turn my head just in time to see a mushroom cloud of smoke and fire bloom from the north, coming from the heart of Bragg's. Seconds later, fireworks start to explode.
They whine into the sky and burst open, letting loose a show of colorful sparks against the smoky backdrop. Dozens and dozens of fireworks, all of them showering us with a beauty that contrasts the horror around us. The ground trembles with each detonation. Fireworks are legal in this county, Eric hisses to me. I drove down here with some buddies freshman year to get some and take them back to Arcata. Something happens. A handful of zombies break away from the truck, stumbling away into the smoke. They make their way toward the fireworks that shred the air with sound. I hold my breath, not daring to hope. The Alpha hisses, lips peeling back from teeth. It stalks away from the truck, moving in the direction of the fireworks. It clicks as it goes, calling to its horde. The truck vibrates as the zombies pound and scratch at it in frustration. Then, one after another, the monsters lumber away in clumps. They follow their alpha while showers of light explode in the sky above us. Finally, the way is clear. The last of the zombies breaks away like an iceberg sloughing off a glacier. As a unit, we surge to our feet. We leap out of the truck, each of us landing lightly on the ground. The edge of the city is still littered with the undead, but the bulk of them have moved on to the fireworks show. It's early evening now, and the sky is darkening. It makes the flames and fireworks look even brighter. I lead my people out, heading south. Once again, we zigzag down the highway. The little noise we make is masked by the fireworks. Another boom rakes the air, followed by another burst of firelight. Another gas line, no doubt, or something equally flammable. As I dodge around a cluster of bodies heaped on the side of the road, it occurs to me that I'm exhausted. Physically and mentally exhausted. My body aches. All I want to do is curl up and go to sleep somewhere safe. Frederico's voice patters in my brain, his words from so long ago rising to the surface. Don't think about the pain. Think about the finish. That had been spoken to me at a 100-miler in the Arizona desert on a day when temps blistered well above 100 degrees. I was tired. I was hot. I was sunburned. Crystals of salt covered my clothes, having leached out of my body during the long, hot, toiling day. How about I just lay down on a cactus? I had asked. It's a legitimate DNF if I'm covered with cactus quills. What did I say about pain? Frederico replied. Quit thinking about it. Focus on the finish. I can practically feel Frederico running by my side. My friend might be dead, but he isn't gone. I set my jaw and will myself to see the end of this zombie-infested town. The safety of the open road lies ahead, just one more mile. One more mile and we'll be free. We head into a narrow tunnel of cars. Stray zombies bump around, struggling to find a way toward the fireworks. We cut them down as we run. Three quarters of a mile. We hit a patch of dead bodies. There must be at least three dozen of them. We jump over and around them. When one latches onto Reed's ankle, Eric is there. His knife crunches through the skull, spraying blood across his face. Half a mile. I see the pinch point of Highway 1, the four-lane road narrowing down to two, Dusk looms large and welcoming, open coastal land rolling out beyond the town. Quarter mile. Ash and Caleb cut through three zombies that wander too close to our group. They make no sound as they attack. All I hear is the crunch of bone and the thud of bodies. The sign reads, Thanks for visiting Braggs. Come back again soon. And just like that, Braggs ejects us from its depths. We run into the cool evening, smoke from the fire boiling after us and clinging to our clothes. We don't speak. In silent consent, we keep running. 
putting distance between us and the town. Finish line. We made it. I send a silent thank you to Frederico. Wherever he is, I know he hears me. Eighteen. Why? Jessica. I have a perfect view of Sean through the open window. It's nearing dusk. The fence surrounding the fort sends long shadows across the ground. The team of fishermen and gardeners are just returning to the compound, herded at gunpoint by Rosario's minions. The smell of beans permeates the air, a sign that dinner is being cooked. The idea of Rosario and her pack of leeches eating our food makes my blood boil. Chill, salty air pebbles my skin with goose flesh. I don't close the window. I like the cold air. Makes it easier to forget the heat of the skin of the men who have been in here. And Sean. The asshole. I know he heard everything. He's the real reason I opened the windows in the first place. No reason for me to suffer alone. I know my fate hurts him every bit as much as it hurts me. Just like his fate is like an open wound in my chest. We might not be married anymore. But we still love each other. It's not the same kind of love that existed when we first met, when we were two dumb college kids getting wasted at frat and sorority parties on the weekend. It's evolved into something darker and infinitely more complicated. But I still love that man more than I love life itself. It's too bad the loathing and resentment outweigh the love. I run through the list of STDs I remember studying in high school. Syphilis, chlamydia, hepatitis, gonorrhea, herpes, crabs. I don't even remember what most of that stuff is. AIDS. I push that thought away as soon as it creeps into my brain. There's nothing I can do about it. At least I can't get pregnant. I hang on to this knowledge. I had an IUD put in after Sean left me. I had a vague idea about trying to meet someone on a dating website. I never got around to creating a profile for myself. The thought of Bella and Steph getting impregnated by the monsters who have enslaved us makes me want to burn shit down. That's another thing I've saved them from. At least for the moment. I have the men entertained for now, but I'm not stupid enough to think it will last. Sooner or later, they'll turn their eyes to other women in the fort. They'll turn back to Steph and Bella. We can't exist in this new state as slaves. It's no way to live. I, for one, would rather die than endure another hour inside this awful motorhome. Alvarez is going to have to make the hard call, and soon. He's going to have to accept that he can't save all of us. We're going to have to fight, even if Rosario's minions are stone-cold sober. Jesse! The voice, cracked with thirst and infused with pain, carries to me through the window. I turn, looking out at Sean. Jesse! He croaks. I stare at him without responding. His wrecked body is a perfect mirror to my wrecked soul. Combined, we would be the perfect embodiment of ruin and waste. It's the first time in a long time we've been on an even playing field. Jesse, I'm... What did you say to him? Sean hangs his head. I didn't think it was possible for his shoulders to sag any lower, but they do. He doesn't ask me what I'm talking about. 
He understands my question perfectly. Silence stretches. Somewhere in the distance I hear crying. Even more distant is the pounding of the ocean waves. Fort Ross was going to fall, no matter what I did, Sean says. Don't bullshit me. You know what I mean. Sean says nothing. When he looks across the ten yards of hard-packed dirt that separates us, I see the truth in his eyes. Seeing it isn't enough. I want to hear him say it. What did you say to get him to let you pretend to be the leader? Sean raises his head. The waning light glistens off his open wound. Much of the blood has scabbed over, but parts of the bite wound still seep fresh red. I told him to take care of you. It's the confession I wanted, but the words don't make any sense. I try to grasp them, to study them for better understanding, but the meaning eludes me. What are you talking about? You're too angry these days to notice how he looks at you. I recoil from the screen. Surely Sean doesn't mean what I think he means. I must be at least ten years older than Alvarez. Besides, there are plenty of women in the fort who fawn over him and flirt because he's... Well, he's Alvarez. Our leader. Strong. Capable. Caring. Good-looking. A perfectly eligible bachelor in every sense of the word. Hell, he would have been a catch before the apocalypse. Now that the world's ended, he's the gold standard. Jesse, you deserve to have someone. I want you to be happy. I would have been happy if you'd let me die. My words stab across the distance like a striking snake. Sean flinches at the force of them, but doesn't back down. You two would be good together. You both like taking care of other people. It's what you do best. I snort. I don't take care of anyone anymore. Bullshit. You're taking care of Steph and Bella right now. Don't deny it. It's what you do, Jessica. You nurture. You love. You protect. His words ignite a fire inside me and not in a good way. I'm so angry I feel like hellfire might blast from every pore in my body and raise Fort Ross to the ground. My hands tremble with the force of it. I slam shut the window and yank the curtain in place. I can't look at Sean. I flop onto the bed and cover my head with a pillow, grinding my teeth as my heart races in my chest. My hands shake. I'm almost relieved when the door to the RV opens and another stinky, rotting man climbs inside. I rise up to face him, refusing to let him see fear or submission. There's so much fire inside me that I half expect him to burst into flame when we make contact. He doesn't, of course. Science doesn't work that way. But he will. All these fuckers are going to pay. Somehow. Some way. If I have to burn Fort Ross down myself to make it happen. Nineteen. Rest. Kate. I don't stop until we're a mile out of town. I pull to a halt beside a green sign with reflective white letters that reads, Mendocino, ten miles. I've been to this area enough over the years to know that it's mostly unpopulated. 
There are miles of open land that snake alongside the ocean. There may be the occasional home or ranch interspersed along the highway, but there will be no more big towns to contend with. Until we get to Mendocino. The town is a fraction of the size of Bragg's, but it's a tourist destination. There's no telling how many undead we might encounter within those city limits. My people stand in a loose circle in the middle of the road, everyone breathing hard from our brush with death. Caleb leans over his thighs, sucking in great gulps of air and wiping sweat from his forehead. Reed crouches on the far side of the road, puking. He's never had a good stomach for running. Ben stands off to one side, staring back in the direction of Bragg's while he catches his breath. Watching him stirs the kernels of fear I felt earlier when he nearly died on the bridge, but the fear is small compared to everything else I feel for him. I touch his shoulder. Hey. When he turns around, I step into his warmth. His arms come around me. I'm sorry. I knot my hands in the fabric of the sweat jacket he wears and lean my cheek against him. His arms tighten. He holds on to me like he'll never let me go. It feels so good. I told you I wasn't dropping this, he says gruffly into my ear. A little temper tantrum isn't going to deter me. I laugh silently into his chest. When I look up at him, the skin around his eyes crinkles. I love the way he looks at me. Just don't almost die on me again and we won't have a problem, I say. Ditto. I plant a quick kiss on his lips, trying to shake the fear of losing him. Despite my apology, it still looms large and scary in my mind. We congregate with the others. They're smudged with soot and look exhausted. Reed swishes his mouth out with water and spits it to one side. Dude. That sucked. Could be worse. I try to keep my voice light. I once saw a man at an aid station who'd tripped on a root and snapped a bone in his foot. The bone stuck out of the top of his foot. The story is meant to make everyone feel better, but I can see by the widening of eyes that it's having the opposite effect. Let me guess, Ben says. He leans against the road sign, shoulders hunched with fatigue. The motherfucker still managed to make it to the finish line. I shake my head. No. He had to ride a horse out of the canyon where he fell. We were miles away from a road. No one speaks. The distant keen of zombies fills the air. Where are crickets when you need them? I want to kick myself. I should have lied. I should have told Ben the guy managed to drag his ass to the finish line with a bone sticking out of his foot. Mama, Reed says, you just ruined our ultramarathon illusion. I thought you guys were supposed to keep going no matter what. Maybe that hadn't been the best story to tell. I try again. There's a race through the Colorado mountains called Hard Rock. A few years ago, one of the front runners fell and dislocated his shoulder 13 miles in. That piece of ultra runner history had left me and Frederico awestruck for days. Not only did the guy finish the race, but he won it. How far is Hard Rock? Caleb asks. A hundred miles. Maldita sea. Ash breathes. That is some crazy fucked up shit. I rake my gaze over the group. You guys are all ultra runners. Every single one of you. You all ran 33 miles on the Lost Coast. We just ran another five to get through Bragg's. You guys are all badasses. And we're not even done yet, Ben mutters. And we're not even done yet. I agree. Does it count, since we rode a car from Usal Beach to Bragg's? Caleb asks. Hell yes. It's called a stage run. It means we're running in stages. It's a different kind of ultra. They look at one another, exchanging slow, pleased grins. 
thank God. So long as I can keep their heads in the game, I can get them to the finish line. It's another ten miles to Mendocino, I say. After that, it's a good seventy-five miles to Fort Ross. None of us are going to survive this trek if we don't decide here and now that we're going to finish. Understand? It's mind over matter. Every single one of you has to make the decision that you're going to finish. That's all it takes. No one answers. Ben looks like I just kicked him in the balls. Even Reed, ever upbeat, looks like I deflated his inner tube. Can we go back to that part about there being 85 miles between us and Fort Ross? Caleb asks. Are we going to run the whole way? I shake my head. There are long stretches of open road. If we can find a car that works, we can drive. Or maybe we can find some bikes. But no, I don't think we're going to have to run the whole way. Thank fucking God, Ben mutters. The rest of the group lets up a collective sigh of relief. So much for my pep talk. I had meant to inspire them. Instead, all I'd done was scare the hell out of them. We take a reprieve to eat, drink, and relieve ourselves. We don headlamps and flick them on. Reed finds a stream that runs from the open grassland out to the ocean, which we use to refill our packs. No one asks if the water is safe. There's no telling if water out of a faucet would be any good either. All we can do is keep hydrated and hope for the best. Um, guys... Eric pulls off his glasses and cleans them on the hem of his shirt. Does it look like it's getting smokier out here? Seven heads whip in the direction of Bragg's. Eric slips his glasses back on and peers north with the rest of us. The sun has set. The stars are obscured by the smoke that chugs into the sky. The fire has grown bigger and more ferocious in the five minutes we've rested beside the road sign, in mounting horror, I realize the flames aren't content to eat the town of Bragg's. They're chewing their way through the grassland flanking the side of the highway. But it's wet, Ash says. The grass shouldn't burn. The top of the grass is wet, Caleb says grimly. The undercarriage must still be dry enough to burn. Damn it. Fire isn't even the worst of our problems. Stumbling along ahead of the flames are zombies. Hundreds and hundreds of zombies. Where a short while ago they had marched toward the flames, they've now reversed direction. And it's obvious why. At the forefront of the horde are two alphas, clicking and keening instructions. The alphas were smart enough to realize the flames are deadly, now they're leading a horde away from Bragg's at a frightening pace down Highway 1 in a collision course with us. Twenty. Sprint. Eric. If Reed or one of the other guys had asked me five minutes ago if I had another sprint in my body, I would have flipped him off. Our frantic tear through Bragg's had left me ready to collapse with exhaustion. But there's something about a wall of flames and a horde of zombies that inspires a person to action. We tear off in a frantic pack, Kate in the lead as we sprint south on Highway 1. I once ran fast when I stole my brother's car keys on the night of his prom. I was pissed that he had a date with a senior girl I'd been crushing on for months. The girl, of course, had never noticed me. I'd been three years younger than her, and nerdy at that. Tom, of course, had dazzled her, even though he was only a junior. I got my vengeance. I stole his car and went out to get ice cream. He'd been forced to drive our mom's beat-up Volvo station wagon to prom. I'd been grounded for a month. The worst part was that I'd felt like shit the whole time. 
knowing I was being a dickhead to my brother. Until I met Kate, that was the fastest I'd ever run in my life. It had been a twenty-yard sprint from his upstairs bedroom to the bright red Honda Civic parked on the curb in front of our house. Then the apocalypse arrived, and with it, Kate. She made us do sprints around the track. She even made us run up and down the stairwell in Creekside. It all feels worth it when we'd been forced to tear through those last few miles of brags. The training had paid off and saved our lives. That near-death experience had been kitten's play. As we streaked down Highway 1 with zombies and fire hard on our heels, I finally understand what it means to sprint. Spit flies from my open mouth as I suck in gulps of air. My lungs feel like they're going to explode out the front of my chest. My arms and back ache from the effort of swinging my torso back and forth in a desperate bid to outrun nature. My feet, already covered with blisters, are blocks of pain. I can barely feel them as they tear over the pavement. They churn, propelling me forward as fast as they can. Don't be a loser, Eric. Quit playing small, little brother. I dig deep and make a silent promise to my brother and my dead girlfriend. I won't give up. I'll run as hard and as fast as I can until my body gives out or the fire catches up with us. I open myself up to the physical pain and embrace it. The fire gains on us, leaping over the open grassland like demonic gazelles. It smashes through scattered buildings and swallows trees and whole gulps. The zombies keen and moan. Many are devoured by the flames, but huge swaths of them continue to stagger forward and stay just ahead of the fire. I do my best to block out the madness behind us, to narrow my focus on my breath, my body, and the road beneath my feet. You could be faster than any of them if you didn't half-ass it, Lila once said to me. It had been at the end of a particularly grueling workout in the stairwell. I think Reed had thrown up two times that day. No more half-assing it. There is one point I'm very clear on. I don't want to die. Our group streams down the road in a pack. The waves pound against the cliffs to our right in a never-ending surge. I focus on the sound of the water, finding it preferable to the roar of the flames and the keening of the zombies behind us. How ironic that a little over a day ago, I never wanted to hear the ocean again after nearly drowning in it. Tom. I picture my perfect big brother, He's crystal clear in my mind's eye. In his jeans and a tight-fitting tee, he carries a baseball bat. A baseball bat would definitely be his weapon of choice. It was his favorite of all the varsity sports he played. He can swing that thing hard and fast. It would be his perfect zombie weapon. And he would take out a lot of zombies with it. Sure, some of them would be his fraternity brothers, that was inevitable, but he would save a fair number of them, along with some of the girls from the neighboring sororities. Now, they'd be holed up on their campus just like I was with the Creekside crew. They would be discovering new ways to survive. Dom would be their leader. Don't let up, Kate shouts. She sucks in big gulps of air between words trying to encourage us even as she struggles to breathe. Whatever you do, don't let up. This run is for keeps. You have to make it count. How she can talk at all is beyond me. My eyes flick across the road before us. To the left is an abandoned barn, half of the roof caved in. In front of the barn is a pickup truck with faded blue paint truck, Reed gasps. No, Kate snaps. No time. She's right. 
the fire eats its way south, devouring everything in its path. If we stop to try and get a vehicle, it will be on us. Breathe through the pain, Kate says. Don't let up. Focus on the finish. A sob rips itself from Ash's throat. She keeps up, but from the look on her face, I can tell she's in as much pain as the rest of us. Tom. My brother's face again floats before me. Tom would make it out of this alive. Hell, he is alive somewhere. He's alive, and he's keeping his frat brothers and their sorority sisters alive. I can do this. My brother was a golden boy, but only because he chose to be a golden boy. I chose to be a half-assed slacker. From now on, I choose to be a golden boy like Tom. I'm getting out of this alive. Whatever it takes, I don't care how much I hurt. I'm not stopping until it's safe. We hurtle past two abandoned cars on the side of the road. One of them has a zombie inside. The doors hang open on the other. There's no time to look for keys. Five miles, Kate wheezes at us as she glances up from her watch. We've gone five miles. Halfway to Mendocino. This news might hearten me if the fire wasn't gaining on us. If we can just get to Mendocino, if we can just get there, maybe we can find shelter. I don't know why I think it will be any safer in Mendocino. I've never been there. Kate says it's a small tourist town perched over the ocean. It sounds like a nice place, a safe place, a place where we can wait out the fire. But California wildfires are monsters in their own right. This one could burn for hundreds of miles out here. I've seen wildfires devastate thousands of acres, and that's with fire crews fighting to contain them. The hordes behind us have disappeared, devoured by the flames. There are a few stragglers, but not enough to worry me. Our true enemy is the flames. Fear pumps through my veins. It fuels me, pushing me through the pain. It propels me down the road on a headlong run for my life. Zombies! My eyes flick up. The sky is dark. The beam from my headlamp cuts through the smoke that swirls around us. It illuminates another horde of zombies. This one coming straight for us. They march north on Highway 1, drawn to the sound of the fire as surely as the zombies of Bragg's had been before the Alpha led them away. This new horde cruising in our direction has no Alpha to turn back. We are going to be sandwiched between fire and two hordes of the undead. Kate! I call, panic tearing through my bloodstream. Kate! What are we going to do? She throws me one anguished glance. Her eyes rake over our small contingent, wild with fear for our safety. Then I see her jaw set. Ocean, she barks. Now. Fuck me. I don't argue with Mama Bear, even though the idea of going into the ocean makes my legs want to collapse. Not to mention... There are sheer cliffs between us and the water. We stream off the road and toward the precipice that snakes along the coast. We skid to a stop at the edge, staring over a sharp bluff that plunges straight down to the water. Over the edge, Kate orders. Drop down to that ledge. That ledge, she refers to, is a good ten-foot drop. Shit. My discomfort with heights clogs my throat. First the bridge, then another bridge, and now over the edge of a cliff. Are you going to be a golden boy, or are you going to be a dead loser? I mutter to myself. 
My muscles scream as I crouch down and lower myself over the side. I dangle there, digging my fingertips into the earth. I kick at the sandstone bluff, trying to find a toehold for my shoes. The fire rips by overhead, burning the tips of my fingers. I shriek, sliding down the face of the cliff. My nails snap off as I try desperately to dig them into the hard surface. My feet search for even the smallest toehold. I'm going to fall. I'm going to fall into the ocean and die. Thank God Tom is still alive. There's still someone to carry on the family name. I'll get to see Lila. I never really thought much about what happens after death, but in my gut, I'm sure I'll see Lila again when I die. Someone grabs the back of my pack and yanks. I land on a small, uneven ledge, sprawling on my back. Ben leans over me, breathing hard. You have a bald spot on your forehead, he remarks. At least your whole head didn't catch on fire. I have no words. I remain sprawled on my back, sucking in air and staring at the world above me, where fire burns. Twenty-one. Nails. Jessica. I lay on my side, eyes closed, aching from the inside out. I'm swathed in the tightest clothes I could find in the tiny closet I shared with Sean. Tight clothes are the hardest to get off. I don't plan to make it easy for the next asshole who comes in here. With several hours to go before sunrise, I have no doubt there will be another one. Since Rosario poured out all the booze, there isn't much else to entertain our captors. The ones not on watch sit around campfire rings feasting on our hard-won food stores. I listen to them dice and tell exaggerated stories of bravery. Jesse, I jerk upright at the familiar voice. Alvarez? His face is a dark silhouette in the window screen. What are you doing here? Are you okay? He presses a hand against the screen as though trying to touch me. I inch up to the screen. They'll kill you if they catch you. I don't add that they'll kill someone else, too. From inside the RV, I can see the guards patrolling the Rotchev prison. How did you get out? I crawled out through loose floorboards. I waited until the patrol passed, then slipped over here. Are you okay? The pity and anguish in his voice makes me recoil. I'm fine. I don't want or need his sympathy. How are Steph and Bella? The girls are okay. They're scared for you. Tell them I'm fine. Tell them to take care of themselves. They should make a break for it if they get the chance. Get as far as possible from this place. Jesse. I shake my head at his unspoken question. There's no reason to talk about it. Alvarez, we have to fight. Sooner rather than later. I know we lost the booze, but I know. He interrupts. Soon. We'll attack soon. I want you to be ready. He pushes against the screen. I catch it as it pops free. Open your hand. I extend my palm as Alvarez's arm slips inside. He drops a handful of nails into my hand. You still have that tennis racket you brought to Fort Ross? He asks. Yes. How does he know about the tennis racket? I haven't pulled it out since the day I took up residence in this RV with Sean. Good. And you still have that duct tape Sean used to carry with him on missions? That fucking duct tape. Sean took it everywhere with him, even before the world ended. He bought it in bulk at Costco and kept a roll in every suitcase, briefcase, and car. 
He was always on the lookout for it on scavenging runs. Yes, I have two rolls. Good. Use it to fortify the tennis racket with the nails. Be ready. I tightened my fist around the nails. What's your plan? I'm still working out the details. My trip to you was a test run to see if we could slip out from under the Rochev house without being seen. His mouth stretches into a thin line. I just proved it's doable. We can move out under the cover of darkness and recover the weapons we hid. He has a plan. It's a ballsy plan, but it's not a complete kamikaze mission. What kind of weapons did you guys hide before Rosario got in here? Lots of metal tools. Hammers, wrenches, stuff like that. We have things hidden all over the compound. Everyone is ready to fight. They have hammers, while Rosario's people have guns. I swallow. I might be scared for Alvarez, but that doesn't change the fact that we have to fight. It doesn't change the fact that some of us will have to die to win back our home. I'm going back now. Alvarez squeezes my shoulder. I'll regroup with our people and finalize our plans. With any luck, we'll attack tomorrow night. Just hang on a bit longer. Can you do that? I wish they would attack now. It's the middle of the night, and many of Rosario's people are sleeping. But he's right. They need time to finalize details of a plan. We'll only have one shot at this. I need to be patient. I don't want to endure another minute in this RV, but I will. Alvarez looks at me with earnest eyes. I see how much my situation pains him. I'll be fine, I tell him. You're the one who has to be careful. We have the element of surprise on our side, he replies. They'll never see us coming. I'll be ready to kill when you give the signal, I whisper. Something swells between us in the dark. Silence stretches. His dark eyes soak me in. You're a warrior, Jesse. A damn fine warrior. Don't let these assholes take that from you. These assholes, I grind out in reply. Take nothing from me. He flashes me a grin. I'll see you soon. He gives my shoulder one last squeeze, then disappears into the dark. Twenty-two. Raining Zombies. Kate. The six of us crouch on the rocky outcropping above the Pacific Ocean. I'd call it a ledge if it wasn't so uneven and covered with sharp points. It's ten feet wide at the tips and juts out no more than two feet. The fire burns above us, pouring heat and smoke over the edge of the cliff, Below us, the ocean pounds away at a rocky shoreline. There's nothing for us to do but wait it out. Does this count as a break? I decide to pretend it's an aid station on the most fucked-up ultra I've ever run in my life. We huddle together. I find the closeness comforting. But the truth is that there isn't room to be anything but squashed together. I'm sandwiched between Reed and Ben. I lean my head back against the cliff face and close my eyes. How the fuck are we going to get off this cliff? Going down isn't an option, and the top is at least ten feet above us. I have a wild vision of us standing on one another's shoulders, Looney Tunes style, in a desperate bid to escape. A ball of fire spurts over the cliffside, searing us with heat. We hunch down, 
doing our best to protect our faces. I squeeze Reed and Ben's hands, wishing I could do more to protect the two of them. Wishing I could do more to protect all of them. I look down at my watch. Thirty-two hours. We've been on the move for all that time. Alvarez and his people have been at the mercy of Mr. Rosario for eight hours. My mind replays the series of disasters that have plagued us ever since we left Creekside. Running out of gas in Humboldt Bay, getting attacked by pirates, our boat getting destroyed by zombies in the rudder, our subsequent shipwreck on the Lost Coast, the impassable tidal zone, hypothermia, and bear attack all seem like a really twisted joke. We haven't had a break since we stepped foot on Highway 1. Between zombies, bridges, and fires, it's done its best to eat us alive. And now, here we are, huddling on a tiny outcropping, held hostage between the sea and the inferno. A growl sounds above us. I look up just in time to see a zombie totter over the side of the cliff. Flames lick across his shirt. He falls straight for us. Incoming, Ben bellows. Look out! The zombie crashes down on top of Ash. Ben and Caleb act fast, the two of them like a well-oiled machine. Caleb stabs the zombie in the face while Ben grabs it by the ankles and flings it over the edge. Ash shrieks, batting at the bits of flame that spring up on her shoulder. Eric jumps in and smothers it with his backpack. Are you okay? Caleb grabs Ash by her good arm and turns her so he can inspect her shoulder. See? Her voice is shaky as she bats at the burned fabric. Beneath it is red, blistered flesh. Let me see. Ben pulls out a small first aid kit. He cuts away the burned fabric, applies ointment to her wound, and wraps it with a clean bandage. As he works, another zombie pitches over the cliff. It's twenty feet away, burning from head to toe. It plummets into the ocean below, hissing all the way down. Um, guys, there's more. Reed raises a finger, pointing to the line of tottering bodies above us. There's at least a dozen of them. As we watch, another two fall off the ledge, burning as they fall into the ocean. Fuck me. Ben glares up at the clifftop. Zombie rain. One by one, they continue to walk over the edge. Most of their falls are silent, accompanied only by the customary growling and snarling. They're smashed to pieces on the rocks below, blood and body parts littering the shoreline. If I had any notions of trying to climb down, the pulverized zombies change my mind. Luckily, no others land on our tiny little slice of the world, though there isn't one of us who doesn't keep an eye toward the sky. There's nothing to do except wait out the firestorm. Fire and ash rain down on us. Smoke pours over the side of the cliff in a gray and white tumble. We all cough. I pull my shirt up over my nose to block out the worst of it. The others do the same, a few of them pulling out bandanas. Put water on the cloth you're breathing through, Ben says. He takes a drink out of his pack and spits the water out on his bandana. I squint my eyes in an effort to protect them from the smoke and ash. Of all the things I've encountered on a run, this is the first time I've come up against a wildfire. We huddle together, waiting out the firestorm. It feels like days. According to my watch, several hours have passed. We might die out here. Right here, on this ledge over the ocean with fire raging above us. I squeeze Ben's hand and lean into him. He puts his arm around me and holds me tight, resting his forehead against the back of my neck. I regret not taking advantage of the big bed when I had the chance with him. I'd let my brain get in the way. 
I make a silent promise not to let that happen again. If I have a chance to be with him, even if it's on some dirty floor in a cold shed, I'm not going to miss out. Did you guys feel that? Ash holds out both hands. Is that rain? I squint into the smoke. A second later, a cold sting hits the top of my head. Another few seconds pass. Three drops hit the narrow space between me and Ben. God damn, Ben exclaims. We may survive after all. He plants a kiss on my lips. I'm so relieved that I grab him around the neck and kiss him back just because I can, because we're both alive. Good thing we got chased by zombies and fire, Reed remarks. If not for near-death experiences, you two would never make out. Good-natured laughter fills the air. I can't help laughing myself as I squeeze Ben tight with both arms. The rain begins to fall in cold earnest. Thunder rolls through the sky, sending vibrations through the earth. Never in my life have I been so happy for rain. I turn my face skyward, letting the fat, cold drops hit my skin. A fork of lightning flashes above us. The wind picks up, whipping across our bodies. It isn't long before we're all shivering in the rain. I crane my neck, trying to gauge the severity of the fire above us. The heat of the flames is gone. The ash that falls is sodden. There's still smoke, though most of it has turned into steam. We have to get off this ledge and find shelter, or we're all going to be hypothermic. It would be nice to have a day where we're not being yo-yoed between hypothermia and burning to death. I shield my eyes from the ash and study the cliff face. Any of you expert rock climbers? Five pairs of eyes turn in my direction. Everyone shakes their heads. All right, I mutter. Looney Tunes escape plan it is. I survey our group. Caleb, Reed, I gesture to the two young men. They're the tallest among us. Reed is the lighter of the two, his build lean, while Caleb is the stronger. Caleb, you need to boost Reed up to the road. Reed, once you get to the top, you're going to have to pull us up, one by one. They stare at me. You're serious, aren't you? Caleb says. Dead serious. Unless one of you knows someone who can pick us up in a helicopter, that's the only way any of us is getting off this ledge. I can always count on a big dose of crazy with you. Ben slaps me on the shoulder. To the rest, he barks. What are you waiting for? You heard the woman. Let's get the fuck off this ledge. Twenty-three. Wet Run. Eric. Sooty, scraped, and exhausted, the six of us soon find ourselves back on Highway One. The beams of our headlamps reveal roads scarred with ash. All the grassland on the east side of the road has been reduced to scorched earth. The wildfire tore through everything in sight, turning the land black. A quarter mile down the road is an abandoned car that's been reduced to a crispy shell. Farther down the road is the remains of a house that still flickers with flame. Smoke and steam trail into the sky. Despite the chill that settled into my body, I feel nothing but wholehearted love for the rain. I'd rather be cold and drenched than dead. Now what? Ben asks. Now? Kate wipes rainwater out of her eyes. Now? We run. The town of Mendocino is only a few miles away. We can look for shelter and regroup once we get there. We slog down the road at a steady lope. Grit and ash rush down the road as rain sloughs down. Water splashes up with every step I take. 
I'm forced to shorten the angle of my headlamp to better see the road directly in front of me through the rain. The hat I picked up in Bragg's keeps my glasses from being a smeary mess. Zombie corpses are everywhere. Huge piles of them litter the road in charred heaps. That's an efficient way to get rid of Zams, Ben says as we veer around a pile of bodies. Yeah, if you're not worried about burning your town down, Reed replies. The rain is miserable. I narrow my focus to the road, concentrating on each step, one foot in front of the next. It's the only thing I can do. It's what Kate taught me to do. My fingers are the first things to go numb, followed shortly by my toes, then both of my feet. Black water splashes up from the road with every step, soaking me all the way up to my waist. The windbreaker I donned in Bragg's is plastered to my body. Lila never would have made it out here. I hate the thought as soon as it forms. Yes, Lila didn't handle the apocalypse well. Yes, at one point it got so bad she refused to leave Creekside. Yes, there were days when she wouldn't even leave our dorm room. I wrote her off. I hate myself for that. In my mind, I never saw her surviving more than a year, two taps. Sometimes it feels like she's still here. Her almond eyes, always alive with fear, follow me around like hunting hounds. It had been like that when she was alive. Looking at her was like staring fear in the face. The only exception was when she argued with me. Whenever we bickered, she didn't look afraid. That was part of the reason why I liked riling her up. It was also fun to banter with her, but mostly I liked seeing her not afraid. Left foot, right foot, left foot, right foot. I focus on the essential rhythm of moving forward. The road seems to stretch on and on and on. It doesn't help that rain clouds have blotted out all the stars. If not for our six headlamps, we'd be in complete darkness. I think about Fort Ross, about the people counting on us. I might be wet, cold, and tired, but at least I'm not being held at gunpoint. I have it easy in comparison. What's a little physical discomfort in comparison to the hell they're probably enduring right now? A green road sign leaps out of the darkness, the reflective letters catching the headlight beams. Mendocino, population 1008. A large house comes into view. It looks like it may have been a bed and breakfast, gauging by the burned sign in front of the two-story gingerbread house though the building wasn't completely destroyed by the fire. It doesn't look entirely stable, either. Stay alert, Kate calls. Be on the lookout for anything that looks safe enough to give us some shelter. The downpour coats my skin with an icy overcoat. My fingers shake with cold. Only running keeps me from succumbing to the chill completely. My friends don't look any better. They're all as numb and exhausted as I am. Then I see another green road sign. Even through the rain slurring my glasses, it's impossible to miss. Fort Ross. Seventy-five miles. I stop dead, staring at the sign. Everyone halts in the middle of the road, all of us taking in the enormity of that green sign. Seventy-five miles. I swallow. We've probably already gone over forty on foot. Do we have another seventy-five miles in us? The doubt feels like a betrayal of Kate and everything she's done for us. I know better than to let that kind of thinking sneak in. 
Kate warned us about it many times. Ultras are finished with the mind, not the body. How many times has Kate said that to us? More times than I can count. If she says we can run another 75 miles, that's what we'll do. Look, Kate raises a hand, pointing through the damp. She adjusts her headlamp, sending the beam out into the darkness. Come on, she says. Let's get out of the rain and regroup. It takes me a minute to see what she's talking about. I'm looking for a building or a house of some sort, but I don't see any. Then I spot it. In a roadside turnout is a big blue semi-truck with orange flames on the side. The trailer is scorched black from the wildfire, but the cab is miraculously intact. Not only will it get us out of the rain, it will keep us safe from any stray zombies that might be around. I pick up the pace, angling toward the semi. Ben is the first of us to reach it. The side of the driver's door is painted with the words, Wild Thing. The edges of the letters are highlighted with flames. He has a knife out when he opens the door. A zombie in a bloody flannel tumbles out, snarling and raking the air with stubby hands. Ben makes short work of it with a knife through its nose. When no other zombies emerge, we clamber inside. The stench of rot is strong inside the semi, but we're all used to it by now. There's a small bed in the back of the truck cab. I pile onto it with Reed, Caleb, and Ash. Ben and Kate take the front seats. The first thing I do is take off my shoes and turn them upside down. A stream of water runs out of them. I root around in my running pack. The extra pair of socks I packed are also wet. Oh, well. Not that I really had a chance of having dry feet with that rainstorm outside. At least it's not drumming down on my head anymore. I peel off my shirt, attempting to wring out the damp. I glance up to see Ben and Kate staring at each other. He's in the sweatpants he picked up in Bragg's. She's in a sports bra and stretchy black pants. Both are shivering like the rest of us. From the looks on both their faces, the gap between the two front seats may as well be the English Channel. I forgot my dating for dummies handbook back at Creekside, Reed says, twisting his shirt between both hands. But I read that thing cover to cover five times, and I know for a fact that on page 167, it says you can hold your woman when you're both half naked and shivering. It's totally legit, even with all of us around. Ben flushes and grumbles a string of curse words. Kate wrinkles her nose with embarrassment before sidling out of the driver's seat and into Ben's lap. These two might be the oldest among us, and they might be apocalypse badasses, but they're worse than teenage virgins. If not for that bear, I'm not sure they'd have ever gotten together. Kate lets out a small sigh of contentment as Ben's arms wrap around her. In spite of everything, she looks happy. Seeing them together makes me remember how much I miss Lila. Here's some towels and dry clothes. Ash pulls out a handful of dry cloth from an overhead compartment. I grab one of the t-shirts, glad for a chance to dry my skin. Now what? The unspoken question rests on the tip of my tongue. Do we take a short breather then resume our run through the rain? Fort Ross. Seventy-five miles. Up until this point, I've embraced the running. It hasn't always been fun, and it sure as shit isn't easy. But there's a quiet satisfaction in knowing I can make it. For the first time, I find my confidence wavering. Shut up, loser. That's what Lila would say. 
Don't be a weenie. Tom wouldn't roll over and throw in the towel, that's for sure. For the first time in my life, I feel like I'm cut from the same cloth as my big brother. He wouldn't give up. Neither will I. Lives depend on us. If I have to drag my sorry ass another 75 miles, that's what I'm going to do. I dry my glasses and return them to my face. That's when I spot the CB radio. A jolt goes through my body. Leaving my sodden clothes in a pile on the floor, I shoulder my way into the front. Ben frowns as I wedge myself between the front seats. I'm too excited to explain. I snatch the CB microphone, my thumb pressing the switch on the side. My other hand reaches out to spin the dial on the display. Dude. Reed has seen what I'm doing. He leans forward, his body filling the tiny egress between the front and back part of the semi. If we can get it working, we may be able to talk to Creekside. Just saying those words sends a bolt of excitement through me. If we can contact Carter and the others, they might have an update on Fort Ross. They may even be able to get a message to Alvarez and let him know that we're coming. Ben, did you check that zombie truck driver for keys? Do I look like an amateur? Ben pulls a set of keys from his pocket. Wait. Kate grabs the keys out of his hand. That could bring zombies. Semis aren't exactly quiet. I think most of the zombies were burned up in the fire, I reply. You saw the big piles of them on the road while we were running. She hesitates, glancing out the dark window. I think it's worth the risk, I say. Any information we can get could help us. The kid has a point, Ben says. Still. Kate hesitates. It's not just the zombies we could attract. That sobers everyone. I can't speak for anyone else, but I, for one, am thinking of Mr. Rosario. If any of her people are out here, firing up the semi would be equivalent to shooting off a flare gun. But that seems like a small risk. Fort Ross is 75 miles away. Presumably, all of Rosario's people are there. The likelihood of any of them being around here is slim. The chances of reaching Creekside are high if I can get the semi to fire up. Okay. Kate nods. We'll try it. Ben and Ash, you take up a position on the north side of the truck. Caleb and Reed, you take the south. Protect this truck. Wordlessly, everyone pulls on wet shoes before climbing out of the truck. Ben passes out glocks to everyone. Just in case, he says. Knives and zombats are the first line of defense. But don't hesitate to use the glocks if shit goes south. Kate gives a tight-lipped nod of approval. She dislikes guns, almost as much as she disapproves of engines. But if you're going to use one, you might as well use the other. The rain is still dumping as Ben, Ash, Reed, and Caleb exit the truck. Reed flips me a good-natured middle finger. Next time I get to mess with the radio. As soon as the door closes, I count to 100, giving everyone a chance to get into position around the truck. Then, I slide the key into the ignition. I step on the brake and turn the key. To my delight, the engine groans and turns over, then promptly dies. I turn the key again and pump the brake. Again, the engine protests, snorting and murmuring like a sleepy teenager. Come on, boy, I murmur turning the key a third time. You can do it. Come on. Lives are dependent on you, man. The engine snorts 
and roars to life. Blue lights flare to life across the console. Yes, I slap the dashboard, grinning. That a boy? Kate doesn't share my elation. She's too busy staring off into the dark after Ben. I remember her reaction when he almost died saving my sorry ass. Having lost Lila, I understand her terror and anger. I want to apologize to her for nearly getting Ben killed, but when I open my mouth and speak, unexpected words tumble forth. I don't regret loving her. Kate's head whips in my direction. She doesn't play dumb, but just looks at me. The fear is plain in her eyes. It hurts like a motherfucker, but I don't regret it, not for a second. Lila was, hands down, the most amazing girl I ever met. A shudder goes through Kate. I already lost one love in my life. If anything happens to Ben, it will break me. My throat tightens with emotion. I'd do it all again, Kate. I'd take the pain all over again. Just to have one more day with her. Tears press against the back of my eyes, but I hold them back. Kate looks away, but her hand reaches out and squeezes mine. Thanks, Eric. I furtively wipe a hand across the back of my eyes, then focus my attention on the CB radio. Time to phone home. Twenty-four. Phone home. Eric. Creekside, this is Mama Bear and Company. Over. Creekside, I repeat, this is Mama Bear and Company. Are you there? Over. Holy fuck! The answer explodes out of the microphone, stinging my ears with its intensity. I recognize Johnny's voice immediately. Mama Bear, is that really you? Over. Kate's eyes widen. Her voice wavers with emotion as she says, Wandering Rider, is that you? Holy fuck, it is you. Where are you guys? Muffled noise comes out of the CB speaker. Guys! Johnny bellows. Wake the fuck up! It's Mama Bear! She's alive! I feel a grin spread across my face. I snatch the microphone from Kate. Wandering Rider, this is Fat Loser, over. You guys okay? Fat loser. Oh my god, man, we've been so worried about you. Where the hell are you guys? Is everyone okay? Mom? Carter's voice fills the speaker. Mom, are you okay? Where are you? Kate takes the microphone back from me. I'm okay, baby. We're in Mendocino. Mendocino? Are you on your way back from Fort Ross? Negative. We haven't made it there yet. We ran into some obstacles. Understatement of the year. I snatch back the microphone. Any word from Fort Ross? Have you guys heard from them? Negative, Johnny says. I check in with them every two hours, but they've gone radio silent. A chill runs across my spine. Just because they haven't answered doesn't mean they're dead, I remind myself. It could just mean they're in a shitload of trouble. How are you communicating with us? Johnny asks. You must have found a radio somewhere. We're using a CB radio in a semi-truck. Eric figured out how to get it working. Kate flashes me a quick smile. The quiet pride in her eyes is enough to make me feel like I could run another 75 miles without breaking a sweat. Are you okay, Mom? Carter asks. 
Is everything else okay? It's our turn to be silent. Kate and I look at each other. Mom? Who's there with you, baby? Kate asks. It's just me, Wandering Rider, and SoCal. SoCal is Jenna's call sign. She adopted it in memory of her family and her former life in Southern California. Kate draws a long breath. There's no easy way to break the news. Leo is gone. Her voice is dry with grief when she speaks. He was gunned down in Humboldt Bay. Susan is... Susan stayed behind in another community farther north. She was injured and couldn't travel anymore. Tell Gary we plan to go back for her. Tell Todd. Kate's voice breaks. Todd is Leo's nephew. She takes a moment to gather herself. Tell Todd I'm sorry. Silence. We'll let Gary and Todd know. Jenna's even voice fills the speaker. Everyone knew the risks when they left. Tell us what's happened to you guys. Kate looks too upset to speak, so I take over. I give them a quick summary of the series of disasters we've encountered since leaving Creekside. Now we're 75 miles away from Fort Ross, I say. It's pouring down rain, and we're freezing our tits off. You guys plan to keep going? Johnny asks. Kate's eyes flare. She snatches the microphone back from me. Affirmative. We're going to Fort Ross. Mom. Someone muffles the microphone on the other end. We hear raised voices. It's easy to imagine what's going on. Carter wants his mom to turn around and come home. Jenna and Johnny are arguing with him. Johnny returns to the radio. Gary and I made a discovery shortly after you guys left. The alpha recording isn't as bulletproof as we originally thought. Too late, I say. We used it and almost got ourselves killed. Shit, Johnny replies. Sorry about that. We field tested the alpha recording after you guys left. It did drive the zombies away from us, but... But it also attracted two nearby alphas, Carter says. But we have a solution, Johnny says. We... Man, it's not a solution. You have to quit calling it that. It... Dude, Carter, just shut up for a second. Mama Bear, listen to me. If you can get rid of the alphas... By that, he means shoot them with a paintball gun. Shut up, man. Let me finish. We found a paintball gun and loaded it with some steel ball bearings we found in the maintenance department. They expel the bearings at almost 200 miles per hour. That's fast enough to put a hole in a zombie brain. The side benefit is that paintball guns aren't very loud. What you're saying, Kate replies, is that we have to get rid of the alphas in order to use the recordings. And we have to do that without getting ourselves killed in the process. Pause. That's exactly what he's saying, Mom. Kate exhales. To me, she says, It was too much to hope for a simple cure-all, wasn't it? As though sensing our despair, Johnny pipes up again. Do you guys still have the recorder? We have two new Alpha commands. One brings the alphas toward you. The other makes them scatter. Kate's eyes grow distant. It's the look she gets when she's coming up with an idea. Usually the idea is equal parts thrilling and equal parts what the fuck. Play them for me, Kate says. I think we can use them. Any chance you can FedEx us that paintball gun? I ask. Maybe half a dozen of them? We could really use them. No one laughs. Are you guys really going to keep going? Carter asks. Yes, Kate and I say together. If Fort Ross has fallen, I'll make sure Mr. Rosario falls too. 
And you're going to use the zombies to do it? Possibly. I'll have to assess the situation when we get there. But I want to have the new recordings, just in case. Carter sighs. Be careful out there, Mom. I already lost Dad. I don't want to lose you, too. Kate's face softens, as it often does when she talks to Carter. I'll be safe, baby. Promise. You do the same, okay? It takes us another few minutes to get the new alpha recordings on Kate's tape player. It's a miracle the small recorder hasn't been crushed, broken, or ruined during our trip. The plastic Ziploc doesn't look like it's going to hold out much longer, though. When we're finished, Kate says, I'll find a way to make contact when we get to Fort Ross. I'm counting on you guys to hold Creekside together until I get back. We'll do, Mama Bear, Johnny says. Be safe, Mom. You too, baby. As I switch off the CB, I reach for the keys, intending to turn off the semi. To my surprise, Kate stops me. Don't turn it off. I frown. What? Why? We're driving to Fort Ross. Driving? The semi? But that will draw every zom between here and the fort. Kate's eyes are fierce when she turns to look at me. That, she says, is exactly the point. Twenty-five. Zombie Train. Kate. I can't believe we're driving. I can't believe it was my idea. I sit in the passenger seat of the semi beside Ben, watching the side view mirror. My running pack sits in my lap. I clench and unclench my hands around the straps, fighting the anxiety that knots in my chest. I can't believe we're driving, Reed says, echoing my own incredulity. Believe it, kid. Ben doesn't look up as he navigates the semi down the two-lane highway. Somewhere in his thirty years of military service, he'd learned to drive Class 8 vehicles. It means... We'll be at Fort Ross soon. Get your head ready for battle. The heater is on full blast, filling the cab with glorious warmth. It's the warmest I've been since leaving Creekside. The drive to Fort Ross will give us all a chance to defrost and dry out. We've left the rain behind. I lean forward, squinting into the side view mirror. A large moon sits in the sky illuminating the train of zombies we've picked up over the last fifty miles. What are we up to? Ben asks me. A hundred and fifty or so, give or take. Considering how far we've driven, that isn't a lot of zombies. If we were in an urban area, we'd have thousands of them on all sides of us. The section of road between Mendocino and Fort Ross is mostly open land. That's a fair amount to use against the fort. Have you sorted out the details of that plan yet? I shake my head. My thoughts drift to Fort Ross and what we're going to do when we arrive. It's been years since I visited the fort as a chaperone for Carter's elementary school field trip. I wish I remembered more about the land surrounding it. There are a few trails but I only explored them once or twice over the years. There was nothing substantial enough to draw me and Frederico there for long training runs. What will we find when we get there? The fort is defensible, which presumably is the reason why Mr. Rosario set her sights on it. Thinking of that disgusting, cruel woman gets my hackles up. My plan is pretty loose at the moment, it's impossible to plan specifics when we don't even know the state of the fort. We'll drop the semi five miles outside of Fort Ross. We'll go the rest of the way on foot, recon the area, and devise a plan from there. 
If we need the zombies, we'll have them, along with the new alpha recordings from Johnny. How do our guns look? Ben calls. Spread out on the narrow bed in the back of the cab are all the remaining weapons we have from Creekside. There's also the generous collection of grenades from Medieval John. Caleb and Ash have been meticulously cleaning the firearms. Almost finished, Ash says. Good, Ben replies. Start thinking about how we're going to divide everything up and how you're each going to carry them. There's only two rifles, Ash says. They're folding AR-15s, which is the only reason Ben had been able to fit them into the weapons pack. Eric gets one rifle, Ben says. He's the best shot out here. I'll take the second. I want everyone to have at least five grenades each. That includes you, Kate. I don't argue, even though I'd be more comfortable handling a live snake. It would be stupid to walk into this situation without weapons. Mr. Rosario scares me more than five grenades ever will. My thighs and waist are chafed raw, Reed announces. They burn like a motherfucker even when I'm sitting still. I think it was almost better when I was running. At least then, everything else hurt too, so I didn't really notice the chafing. Caleb shoots him a quick look. If it makes you feel better, my balls are rubbed raw. I'm pretty sure I'll never have any children. Reed gives him a lopsided grin. Apocalyptic birth control, huh? We'd better get Ben on board. Caleb cracks up at his own joke. He's the only one of us who's gonna need birth control in the near future. A rumble of irritation rises from Ben's throat. He leans over the steering wheel, glaring out at the road. Enough, guys, I say, exasperated. The guys snicker in the back seat as we continue to rumble down the road. How far back are they? Ben asks me. His jaw has loosened. They are the zombies. He's been driving slow, enabling us to gather the zombie train. Quarter mile or so. We only have another few miles to drive. I'm going to speed up to put some distance between them and us. That will give us a good head start when we get out. Good plan, I reply. We don't want to risk getting bitten when we get out of the semi. I haven't exactly figured out how I'm going to use the zombies. With any luck, I won't need them at all. But if the situation at the fort is bad enough, having some undead at our command might be enough to tip the scales in our favor. I won't know for certain until we recon Fort Ross. The engine of the big rig rumbles as Ben downshifts and accelerates. I absorb his profile, trying not to worry about what's ahead of us. Ben has been fighting one war or another his entire adult life. If there's anyone who can survive what's to come, it's him. So why do I have a sick feeling in my stomach? He turns off the road into a long driveway, parking the semi behind a thick strand of oleander bushes. Hard to hide a beast this big. This is the best we can do. It's a good spot. I turn to Caleb and Ash. Weapons ready? We spend the next fifteen minutes sorting weapons and stashing them on our bodies. The glock that Caleb hands me goes onto the belt that holds my knives and zombat. A spare handgun goes into the back compartment. Two extra magazines go into the large front pockets of my running pack. Squished between the dashboard and the passenger seat where I sit, Ben fusses over the location of my five grenades. He puts two of them in smaller pockets on the upper straps of the running pack. Two more go into the stretchy cell phone pockets on either side of the leggings I wear. He frowns, searching for a place to stash the last one. How about the kangaroo pouch in the back? I suggest. The what? Kangaroo pouch. I flip the pack around. In the lower portion of the back is a compartment held closed with magnets. The magnets make the interior easily accessible without having to take off the pack. 
Ben slides the grenade inside, tugging on the fabric to test the strength of the magnets. That'll do, he says after a solid sixty seconds of frowning. It's not ideal, but it's better than sticking it in a pouch you can't easily reach. Promise me you'll blow shit up if you have to. I promise. I squeeze his hand, anxiety gnawing at my gut. How's everyone doing back there? I ask the rest of the group. They've been oddly quiet. We're taking bets on whether you two will start making out before we leave, Reed says. I told them it's not dangerous enough, Eric adds. You guys only make out after near-death experiences. I told them the old man isn't going to let his lady go into battle without a big wet one. Caleb gives Ben a wicked grin. I told them they're being children, Ash proclaims. You little shitheads make me crazy. Ben throws open the door and jumps down. I follow him. Cold ocean air slams into my wet clothing. I'm stashing the keys here. Ben deposits them on top of the front passenger wheel. That way we don't risk losing them. They'll be here for whoever needs them. The others haven't joined us yet. I tug on his hand, pulling him into the shadow of the semi. Be careful out there. I press a quick kiss to his lips. I can't lose you. I'm too mean to die. He draws me close. Keep the crazy shit to a minimum, okay? And don't hesitate to use this. He taps the hilt of my gun. We're not going up against zombies this time. The bullet could be the difference between living and dying. I nod, hoping I won't have to follow his advice. I mean it, Kate. I'll kick your ass if anything happens to you. Dude. Reed drops down out of the semi. Let's go back to the Dating for Dummies book. I guarantee that line was nowhere in that book. Ben turns away from me, growling something unintelligible at Reed. Dude, I'm just trying to help. Ben curses before marching toward the road. I shake my head at Reed, unable to suppress a small smile. Reed is always good at diffusing tension. Silence from here on out, I say as the six of us assemble on the asphalt. We stay together until we see Fort Ross. Then we split into our teams, recon the fort, and meet back at the designated rendezvous to finalize our attack plans. Any questions? No one has a joke or a sarcastic comment this time. I take in my small group, savoring this moment with the six of us. There isn't anyone here I wouldn't give my life for. All right. Let's go. Everyone be safe and be smart. I lead them out at an easy run. We run without headlamps. If Rosario posts a watch, and it would be stupid to think otherwise, the headlamps will expose us from miles away. It's slow going without any decent light, but at least the moon is out. At least it's not raining anymore. Ben falls into step beside me. It feels good to have him close. Maybe someday we can go for a real run together. Not a training run, not a supply run, not a frantic run for our lives. Just a regular fun run for the sheer joy of running and being together. I would like a world like that. We make very little noise as we move down the deserted highway. My eyes constantly roam the area, flicking between the road and the land on either side of us. Over the years of running, I've developed an innate sense of mileage. I mentally count down the miles as we run. Five. Four. The eastern sky turns from black to charcoal gray. Sunrise is near. I pick up the pace, knowing we'll have to get off the road before sunrise or risk being spotted. Three miles. Two miles. One. The land drops away into a cove, 
and suddenly there it is. Perched in the innermost curve of the cove is Fort Ross. The great wooden fortress from a time long ago is once again made relevant in the apocalypse. We draw to a halt, stepping off the road into a cluster of trees. The sky is a dark gray. The moon edges into the horizon, withdrawing its light. The old Russian fort was impressive before the apocalypse. In this new landscape, it seems too good to be true. Towering wooden walls of redwood rise twelve feet high, surrounding the fort in a perfect square. Each fence post is topped with a wooden spike. The walls are six inches thick, built oh so long ago to hold off Native American attacks. Inside the fort are five large structures. Like the fences, they are constructed of thick redwood planks. A lookout tower stands at the southwest and northeast corners, both of them slotted with openings for cannons. I recall the fort having real cannons inside the walls. Besides the original wooden structures, inside the walls are also motorhomes and a scattering of tents. All in all, it's a great setup. I can see why Rosario wanted the compound for her people. With the gardens, grazing land for cattle, and proximity to the sea for fishing, it's an ideal location. Time to split up. The mile 86 marker will be our rendezvous point. I point back up the road to the small green and white road sign sticking out of the dirt. There are a lot of trees and shrubs there for cover. Meet there in two hours. Five heads nod. I gather everyone close for one last group hug. Not even Ben complains about this. I grip his hand hard, hoping to convey all my feelings for him in that single touch. Then we break into two pre-designated groups. Ben, Eric, and Ash sweep southeast. Reed and Caleb are with me. We sweep southwest toward the ocean as the sky brightens with the dawn.